This flute cast is a bit different from usual. A while ago, somebody asked me the question, how do flutes work? And I didn't really have a good answer. So, this video is about how Native American flutes produce sound. So you might think this is a pretty arcane topic. Maybe it's just for physicists or flute makers, but there really is some value for flute players. Uh, there's some cool ornaments we're gonna look at, and we're gonna look at the second register. So the first question is, what is sound? If you hit a drum head, it'll vibrate back and forth for a while. And the drum head will push and pull on the air around it. When the drum head pushes, it compresses the air for a little bit, makes the air denser, gives the air higher pressure. When the drum head moves the other way, it effectively pulls on the air molecules next to it. This reduces air pressure, rarefies it, makes it less dense. Now, just to be clear, drum heads can produce very complex motions and produce lots of different air pressure patterns. But whatever pattern is produced from the sound source, waves of air pressure compression and rarefaction tend to propagate out from the source in all directions. It's like waves on the surface of a pond when a water droplet lands. These waves move out through the air at pretty high speed, something around 760 miles an hour. The speed is sound. The sound waves of alternating higher and lower air pressure move from the source to our ears, where the high and low air pressures push and pull on our eardrums. Our ears convert that motion into tiny electrical signals that travel along the nerves up to the brain. The brain interprets these signals as sound. Drum heads are great for describing how sound works, and it's pretty obvious how you get the sound started. You just hit them. But of course there's major differences between the way drums produce sound and the way flutes produce sound. You don't hit a flute to get the sound started, and flutes produce a continuous sound. So the two big questions are, for a flute, how do you get the sound started, and how do you make it continuous? To answer the first question, I'd like you to go get a dollar bill. Pause the video if you need to, and go get a dollar bill. Now hold the edge of the dollar bill between your first two fingers on each side, about half an inch apart, and bring it up to your lips. But don't touch your lips to the edge. You're leaving a small space. You're going to blow. You're going to make a small hole with your lips and blow across the edge of the dollar bill. The goal is to make a, a soft, high-pitched whistling sound. Give it a try. That sound is called an edge tone. Some people call it a whistle tone. It happens because when air splits to go around an object, it tends to oscillate. Native American flutes are designed to get that oscillation to happen in a very controlled way. Our breath flows through the first cylinder and into the flue, the windway that sits under the block. The air then exits the flue and crosses the sound hole. We'll zoom in on the diagram to see the air hitting the sharp splitting edge. And that's going to act like the edge of our dollar bill, and it's going to create an edge tone. Here's a video of the airflow at the sound hole of a flute. We've got air coming out of the flue on the left, crossing the sound hole, and hitting the splitting edge. Now the body of the flute itself is at the bottom here. The important thing to notice is how the air is oscillating as it hits the splitting edge. This is really where flute makers combine physics, craftsmanship, and their own experience. Their goal is to get just the right airflow and oscillation happening at the sound hole. So, now back to the flute as a whole. I'm simulating here what happens when we put our breath into the flute. It goes through the flue, across the sound hole, and creates an edge tone. Now that edge tone is going to begin affecting the air inside the main sound chamber of the flute. With all the finger holes closed, we've got this long column of air that's getting pushed and pulled by the oscillating edge tone. Now, this is one way of looking at what happens inside the sound chamber. A pulse of alternating high and low pressure moving up and down the sound chamber. High pressure is shown in red, and when it reflects off the end of the flute, it becomes low pressure, shown in blue. This is similar to what happens to a pulse traveling down a rope. When the pulse encounters the end point, it flips and changes direction. Of course, this is a simplification of what's actually going on. To get a better idea, we need to look at the whole sound chamber. So now we've got a simulation of how the entire sound chamber is behaving. 
we can see areas at the ends where the air is moving back and forth, and in the center where the air isn't moving. But it is changing pressure. The red shows higher pressure, and the blue shows lower pressure. So now we've got a resonating column of air that keeps going because we keep providing breath input. Here's a simulation of resonance in a similar instrument, a recorder. It shows low pressure in blue and high pressure in red. The important thing here is that the movements of air in the sound chamber have completely swamped the original edge tone. The moving air from the sound chamber extends out the sound hole and also notice it extends back up into the flue. The edge tone initially got things started, but the continued tone is maintained by our breath, formed into a jet by the flue and flowing into and out of the sound chamber. So all of these air vibrations happen inside the body of the flute. But how do we hear sound? Well, both the sound hole and the end of the flute are open to the outside air. The moving air at both ends of the flute pushes and pulls at the outside air and starts them vibrating back and forth. And that oscillating wave of sound moves towards our ears. Now, of course, the air in the sound chamber vibrates much faster than we're showing here, something like 300 to 800 times a second for mid-range Native American flutes. Now, what happens if we open the bottom finger hole? Well, first of all, the sound has a new opening to come out of. The sound will come out of any place in the body of the flute that's open to the outside air. And also, and this is the big change, we've made the sound chamber shorter air column has a shorter distance to vibrate, and so each vibration cycle takes less time. That gives us more vibration cycles every second, a higher frequency to those vibrations, and our brain interprets that as a higher pitch. Here's another simulation of a recorder showing it emitting sound. In this simulation, all the finger holes are open, so the sound comes out lots of openings in the sound chamber. Notice that each new pressure wave comes out all of the openings, the sound hole, the finger holes, and the end of the flute, and almost exactly the same time. Okay, back to the resonating flute with all finger holes closed. The way we've shown it is great for demonstration, but it's not quite accurate. We've shown the location of greatest change in air pressure right in the middle of the physical sound chamber, right under the fourth finger hole. Here I've added a graph of that air pressure. Now, the reason it's not accurate is that there's an acoustic effect that happens at each end of the sound chamber. It's called the end effect. When the ends of the sound chamber are open to the outside air, as they are with native flutes, the sound chamber gets acoustically lengthened. The reflections of the sound wave that happen actually occur beyond the physical ends of the sound chamber. And, to make it more interesting, that end effect is not symmetric. The sound chamber is acoustically lengthened at both ends, but because the two ends of the sound chamber have different shapes, the sound chamber is actually lengthened much more at the upper end, the end with the sound hole, than it is at the foot end of the flute. Okay, so the sound chamber is longer acoustically than it is physically, and it's also skewed towards the head end of the flute. That means the center of pressure, the point at which there's maximum change in air pressure, is really more towards the head end. It typically winds up very near the topmost finger hole, the finger hole that's closest to your breath. Now here, I've got an improved graph of that air pressure. The sound chamber is acoustically longer than the physical length, and the point of greatest change in air pressure is right under the first finger hole. Now, what happens if you don't quite get that hole completely sealed with your finger? I've shown it here as the finger kind of lifting up, but even a tiny leak on a finger hole has a dramatic effect on the way the flute behaves. The reason? Right at the place where the air pressure has the biggest swings, we're canceling out those swings by letting the outside air in and out. This causes the resonance to immediately change. The length of the sound chamber is effectively cut in half and the frequency of the sound doubles. I've slowed it down on this simulation to make it easier to see. This is often called the second register or the second harmonic. You might hear it as a squeak, a mistake. Oops, I didn't cover all the finger holes. 
but this can actually be pretty useful for flute players. Now try this. Pick up your flute and play your all holes closed, the lowest note, and then intentionally leak the top finger hole just a little bit. We'll show it on the diagram as a, a little tick off the top, a little crack in the top finger hole. Here we go. This is an E minor flute, by the way. You might think that's a squeak, but it's really a note. Compare it against this note, the top, the octave note. They should be pretty close together. Now try this finger on your flute. Top hole open and all the other holes closed. That works on most flutes. That will produce a note that's a, that's a semitone above the octave note. From here, And that's a wonderful note. It works on a lot of flutes, and it's a real high tension note. You can add it to a song, maybe only once in a song, maybe only once in the entire evening, as a really high tension note. There's actually a whole set of notes up in the upper register of the flute, this second register, when it's resonating in a different way. But just like the drum heads, remember the drum heads, there were a lot of different ways the drum heads could vibrate? Flutes are the same. Every flute is going to produce different results up in this second register. This flute can play a few notes. Most flutes can play at least one or two notes. Most flutes will play this note. And then try some other notes. Find them. You'll find some ornaments up there. You'll find some real notes up there. Or as an ornament. And we have another very useful technique we learned, edge tones. If you breathe very, very softly into your flute, before you get the sound chamber resonating, you're going to create an edge tone. It's these high whistling sounds. Give it a try. Now get right close to the mic. Get close to the mic. If you're, at a, if you're in a performance situation, crank up the reverb or crank up the echo. If you've got a loop pedal, you can loop these things. You can create some great sounds. Sounds of the whales, sounds of the birds. Have fun with it. So there's a reason we put this out on YouTube. Some people really want to know how a flute works, but it's not the kind of information that we want to be getting into in our workshops. We feel that when you come to a flute circle or a music workshop or a flute retreat, you don't want to be cluttered up with all this headspace information. At our workshops, we really try as much as possible to play from the heart and make music in the moment. If you'd like to sign up for our newsletter and see our schedule of upcoming events, flute schools, flute retreats, you can visit nativeflutschool.com. And as always, we hope you can join us at a workshop.